worship service, there are some announcements to make today. First, the Matthew 25 team is sponsoring a webinar entitled Be a More Informed Voter, Judges and Courts, on Wednesday, September 23rd from 7 to 8 p.m. The link and more information are in the weekly email. Next, thank you to all the people who helped with the drive through food drive yesterday and to all those who dropped off food. The next drive through food drive will be Saturday, August, October the 17th. And now before our worship service, I want to remind you, as our pastors do every week, at this time when we can't meet within our brick and mortar church, to reach out to three people that you would normally see at church and phone, text, or email them to see how they're doing. Check up and pass the peace of Christ to them. And now let us worship God. Children of all ages, our story is by Oge Mora. She's from Nigeria, and her story is Thank You, Amu. Please come closer to the screen so you can see the pictures. On the corner of First Street and Long Street, on the very top floor, Amu was cooking a thick red stew in a big fat pot for a nice evening meal. She seasoned and stirred it and took a small taste. What a delicious stew, Amu said. Tonight's dinner will surely be the best I've ever had. With that, Amu put down her spoon and went to read a book before supper. As the thick red stew simmered on the stove, its scrumptious scent wafted out the window and out the door, down the hall, toward the street, and around the block until, knock, someone was at the door. When Amu opened it, she saw a little boy. Little boy, Amu exclaimed. What brings you to my home? I was playing with my race car down the hall when I smelled the most delicious smell, the little boy replied. What is it? Thick red stew. Mmm, stew, he sighed. That sure sounds yummy. Amu thought for a moment. She was saving her stew for dinner, but she had made quite a bit. It would not hurt to share. Would you like some? The little boy nodded. And so Amu spooned out some of the thick red stew from the big fat pot for her nice evening meal. Thank you, Amu, the little boy said, and went on his way. With that, Amu closed the door and went back to her book. 
As she read her thick bread stew, scrumptious scent wafted out the window and out the door, down the hall, toward the street, and around the block until, knock, knock, someone was at the door. When Amu opened the door, this time she saw a police officer. Miss Police Officer, Amu exclaimed, what brings you to my home? I was on duty down the street when I smelled the most delicious smell, Miss Police Officer replied. What is it? Thick red stew. Ah, stew, she said, and her mouth watered. That sounds mighty tasty. Amu thought for a moment. There was still enough to share. Would you like some? The police officer nodded. Once again, Amu spooned out some of the thick red stew from the big fat pot for her nice evening meal. Thank you, Amu officer said and went on her way. Throughout the day, people from all across the neighborhood knocked on Amu's door. She fed a shop owner, a cab driver, a doctor, an actor, a lawyer, a dancer, a baker, an artist, a singer, an athlete, a bus driver, a construction worker, even the mayor stopped by. And each time they knocked, Amu shared. Soon the sky darkened, the street lights brightened, and it was finally time for dinner. But when Amu opened her big fat pot of thick red stew for her nice evening meal, it was empty. Amu sniffled, there goes the best dinner I ever had. Sorry and blue, she sat at the table with her empty pot until, knock, 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 knock. Who could that be, Amu wondered. When she opened the door, she saw the little boy, the police officer, the shop owner, the cab driver, the doctor, the actor, the lawyer, the dancer, the baker, why everyone she fed today was at her door. I'm sorry, everyone, Amu sighed. My thick red stew is all gone. I have nothing left to share. The little boy tugged at Amu's sleeve. Don't worry, Amu. We are not here to ask. We are here to give. police officer carried in a fresh salad. The mayor entered with a roast chicken. The baker brought a collection of sweet goodies. Even the little boy presented Amu with something special in a shiny red envelope. Everyone who had knocked on Amu's door that day squeezed inside her tiny apartment, and together they ate, danced, and celebrated while Amu's big fat pot of red, thick red stew was empty, her heart was full of happiness and love. That was the best dinner she had ever had. Amu had a wonderful dinner, even though the pot was empty. Play with, pray with me, please you after me. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, for loving us in every way. Help us to love and not to fuss, because we know that you love us. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Joshua. We'll be reading from chapter 24, verses 1 to 15. So listen for the word of the Lord as it comes to us from Joshua, chapter 24, verses 1 to 15. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in its midst, and afterwards I brought you out. When I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and, and horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Afterwards, you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I handed them over to you. And you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I wouldn't listen to Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you. So I rescued you out of his hand. When you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you. And also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I handed them over to you. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove out before you the two kings of the Amorites. It wasn't by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and oliveyards that you did not plant. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for this day and for this time together. And we pray that in these moments, whenever we are watching this and experiencing this, that your spirit would be between us, that you would move among us and, and open our hearts and our minds and our ears and our eyes that we might hear your word anew and come to experience your will for our lives more fully. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. You know, long after Joshua has led the Israelites into the promised land and they've settled there, he gathers the people together and calls for them to dedicate themselves fully to God. We remember that famous line at the end, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I mean, there's a reasonable chance you've got that cross stitch somewhere in your house right now. But it's important to see that before Joshua declares his allegiance to God and calls for the people to do likewise, he first recounts the story of all that God has done for them. Now, the Bible is a lot of things. It's a guide to moral and ethical living. It's a source of church doctrine and theology. It's a record of history and faith development. But it's also a story or rather a collection of stories that tell of the, of the wondrous, mighty acts of God. Stories that tell of God's power and God's compassion and of the people's experience of them. They are the stories of, of God speaking to Moses from the burning bush and David killing Goliath with just a, a sling and a few smooth stones. Of Jonah being swallowed by a big fish and Daniel spending a restless night in a lion's den. They are the stories of Esther saving her people of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being, being saved from the fiery furnace, of Rahab protecting the spies of Joshua and of Gideon 
putting out his fleece to discern God's will. But they're not just epic stories of of heroes and villains. They're, They're stories of grace and mercy and steadfast love. They're stories of the prodigal son and of his father who welcomed him home. The good Samaritan who risked his own well-being for the the sake of a stranger. And the hemorrhaging woman who risked everything to be healed. There are are many stories that together make up one long story. It begins with the Spirit of God moving over the face of the waters at the beginning of creation. And winds all the way to John's vision of the kingdom of God where the tree of life bears its fruit beside the river of life that, that flows by the throne of God. And while that is the last of the stories that you will find in your Bible, the story doesn't end there. It keeps on going. Now, I don't think you'll see any new additions to the Bibles that you've come to know and love. There there likely won't be any new pages added, no new letters declared canonical. And while Marvel and DC will likely spin out new stories of our favorite superheroes for decades to come, and Lucasfilm will probably continue to add to the story of Star Wars for years, I feel pretty certain the biblical canon will not be expanded. There'll be no sequels. There'll be no reboots. But that doesn't mean the story ends. No, the story of God's relationship with God's people has never stopped. It's always continued on beyond the pages of what we call Scripture. The story of God's grace, mercy, and steadfast love does not end because God's grace, mercy, and steadfast love has not ended. Throughout history, as people have experienced God's power and presence in their lives, they've said so. They've shared their experiences, they've told their stories, and they have added to the long, rich account of our journey toward God's kingdom. It was a story my father told. He grew up in the local Baptist church back in Homewood, South Carolina, and his mother made him and his brothers attend worship every Sunday. Once, when they got to the end of the service and the pastor was making the traditional altar call, And the organist began to play just as I am. For several verses, she played, and nobody came forward. And so my father and his older brother, they began to elbow one another, encouraging them to to, to take one for the team so that we could all just go home. Until finally, someone else came forward, and the song ended, and they all did get to go home. But my dad told me once that he regretted not going forward that day to make that profession of faith while his mother was there to hear him. She died a few years after that, but he never forgot that missed opportunity to show his faith in a way that she could see. So instead, he chose to live the rest of his life as a profession of the faith that she taught him. And just a few weeks before he died in 2018, he told me that he was not afraid because he knew where he was going and he was ready to be with Jesus. It was a story my mother told. Growing up as the youngest daughter of a poor family, she wore hand-me-down clothes and played with paper dolls because her parents couldn't afford the real thing. But one of the most important people in her life was the pastor of her Presbyterian church who took her to church camp every summer. And there she learned and experienced fully the truth that God loves her and is always watching over her and always walking with her. To this day, she wears a small locket on a chain around her neck with the words to the old Sunday school song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And it's my story too. Like my parents before me, mine is a story interwoven with patterns and threads of life in the church. It's the story of a Southern boy raised on Sunday school and church camp, led to ministry as a vocation, who in 2012 heard a call to leave everything and start over to leave the support systems of friends and family, to to leave the only home that my children had ever known, a job working with people that I loved dearly and the familiarity of places and things, the comfort of knowing your way around in the dark. It's a story that echoes for me the stories of Abraham, who God told to leave the land of his ancestors and go to a place that I'll show you. And Moses, sent by God on a mission for which he didn't feel entirely adequate. And Jonah, sent by God to a place he was reluctant to go. And Ruth, led by God to a place of welcome and nurture for her and her family. It is a story of God's providence and of God's care. Here in this place, Mary and I have found a magnificent school 
with teachers and therapists for Harry and amazing, talented doctors and surgeons for Will Gray. And we have found new friends and new adventures for all of us. Here we have found a church to call home in which we experience the fellowship of believers, the care of compassionate people, and the nurture of God's children. It is a story of God's grace, mercy, and steadfast love and the ways that we have experienced it. And it is a story made possible by the church. It is a story that has been handed down to us by the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before and that finds expression in the rhythms of worship, the, the challenges of learning, the rewards of service and the comfort of fellowship in a community of fellow travelers, seekers, believers, and sinners all. It is an epic narrative that spans generations, finding new voice in every time and place, and we each add our own stories to it. My name is Emily Webb, for those of you that don't know me. So what has Overbrook meant to me and my family? The 1989 TV series uses these lines in their theme song. Sometimes you want to go where everyone knows your name, and they're always glad you came, and they're always glad you came. Overbrook means home, family, love, community. A sea of friendly faces has welcomed my family and me, ushering us into the community of Overbrook Fellowship each Sunday morning since I was five years old. As I grew up in Overbrook, I participated in Sunday school, vacation Bible school, youth group, mission trips, and confirmation class. I had many mentors in my journey, my parents, their friends, Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, pastoral staff, and many other members of the Overbrook family. These mentors led by example, giving of their time and talents to help build and nurture our community of Overbrook. I refer to them as my pillars of Overbrook. I have many stories and fond memories of growing up in Overbrook, great Sunday school teachers, youth activities, mission trips, church dinners, and fellowship, family camping, even planting trees at the church farm with my parents at a couple group. I also had many church friends, as I called them. We saw each other on Sundays as we all went to different schools, similar to the youth of today. All of this creating a community of love, caring, and great sense of belonging. I got married at Overbrook, walking down the red carpet aisle, just as I imagined when I was little. But I'm not sure who was happier that day, my father or me. I brought my new family, my husband Jeff and daughters Jessica and Olivia, into the Overbrook community. They were welcomed and nurtured by all. I believe Jessica and Olivia had many similar experiences as I growing up in, the Over in Overbrook. Although the congregation was sim smaller than when I grew up, the sense of community and belonging did not change. They also have fond memories and many great church friendships. They still are amazed when I tell them someone from Oakbrook asked about them. I assure them Oakbrook is their home and they are loved. Again, a place where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. As I look at Oakbrook today, I realize that maybe I am becoming one of those pillars I referred to earlier. My hope is that I'm able to lead by example, giving up my time and talents with teaching Sunday school, serving on committees or commissions, Bible study, quilting group, or social activities. I hope that I will be a welcoming, caring, friendly, and loving Overbrook member, nurturing our Overbrook community and incorporating the youth of our church so they feel this is home, a place you want to go where everyone knows your name and they're always glad you came, home. My name is John Sibley, and I've had the great fortune of being a member of this church since my family moved to Colorado in 2005. Overbrook has given my family and me the opportunity to serve God within the fellowship of a community of believers, and more importantly, a place to give our time and volunteering to this community and mission of the church in the name of Jesus Christ. So what is the benefit of all of this work? Besides just the intrinsic value of helping others with our common mission, I selfishly had great spiritual growth along the way. For example, 
While working on the pastoral search committee, I read through dozens of personal information forms from the potential candidates. It was an opportunity to get different perspectives on the mission of the church, interpretations of scripture, and personal insights on faith from all these individuals so highly educated in both seminary and pastoral experience. As for Pastor Gauze, to quote Bill Birchfield, you had me at Rick and Bobby. That's a nod to a sermon of Bill's we got to view during our search. One of the most worthwhile undertakings I have been involved with is the Stephen ministry. The training under the guidance of the Stephen ministry leaders and subsequent caregiver-care-receiver relationship has helped me immeasurably in my personal and professional life. The emphasis on deep listening and empathy in the directive to not fix another person's situation, but to be there with them so they know they're not alone. One of the virtues of this ministry is, in the words of Cheryl Hubbard, its recognition of the brokenness of the human condition. I'm paraphrasing here, Cheryl. You'll have to forgive me. My time on session gave me yet another opportunity to serve this congregation, alongside many of you, I might add. During the examination of others, when new members are first presented to sessions, I have had the pleasure of listening to people talk about their faith experience, what this church means to them, and their vision for its future. As I heard Matthew Vetter say, and again, I'm paraphrasing, we might not know all the answers, but we'll figure it out together. If you've been counting, I've now quoted three fellow Overbrook members during this talk. I have grown just as much spiritually and personally in my interactions with you as I have in study, training, deliberation, and under the instruction the pastoral staff of this church. I thank the Lord for these gifts, but it is to the congregation and staff here at Overbrook that I owe a great debt of gratitude for nominating, training, and entrusting me to the positions I have held. I hope I have performed to your expectations, because the blessings my family and I have received through this service can never be repaid. Overbrook Church, the place my church home. When I step inside, I feel at peace safe and secure. Overbrook Church, people, my faith family. I feel loved, cared about, accepted, even by those I don't know well. Our pastors love and care about every one of us and their guidance and encouragement, their genuine interest in who we are as individuals and what we have to offer is what pulls us all together. Overbrook Church, the church, God's church. I feel his presence. God is watching over us. God's spirit moves among us. God speaks to us. God comforts us. God moves us. We serve God by serving others. Here at Overbrook, we have many opportunities to do God's work. We can be deacons, session members, Stephen ministers, Sunday school teachers, lay readers, ushers, office volunteers, and more. We reach outside our church community by service at the homeless shelter, packing lunches for the open shelter, food Sunday donations. We give to disaster relief for our country and others. We pack and send boxes of items for our military. Our youth serve others through their mission trip each summer. I love my church for all it is and does, but there's still so much more to do. God grant us the ability to do so. These voices you have heard today are but a few of the stories of this congregation. These are our stories and they are colored deeply by our lives in the church. But I know that you have stories to tell too, and I'm sure that some of them are similar to the stories you've heard today, and some are very different. But they are all important parts of the longer biblical story that we have all inherited. So what is your story? When future generations recount the goodness of God and the way God has worked in the lives of God's people, what will they say about you? What will be your chapter in this long and epic tale? In this stewardship season, we're being called upon to consider the expansive history of God's grace, mercy, and steadfast love, how we have benefited from it, and how we might respond to it. We're being asked to consider the, the rich history of God's people and how they dedicated themselves to God's kingdom. We're being asked to ponder our own chapters in that long and colorful story and how we might dedicate our time, talents, and treasure in helping to write the next one. But I can't really tell you what to do or how to respond. I can only tell you the story and let you make your own decisions. So decide this day whom you will serve. 
But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. To God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come. Amen. to announce the start of the stewardship campaign for 2021 church operations. The campaign theme is Serve God and Serve Others. There's obviously a different feel to the campaign this year, but we continue to face the same needs to fulfill the work and life of Overbrook Presbyterian Church in the coming year. Our scripture message is taken from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. This past week, you should have received a mailing that included information about our campaign, an estimated narrative operating budget, and a pledge card. If not, please contact the church office. 
Over the next few weeks, the committee will be providing additional campaign information during worship in the form of minutes of stewardship. And during this time, we ask that you and your family prayerfully consider your financial commitment to Overbrook's 2021 operations and how and where you could use your time and various gifts and talents to fulfill your response to God's grace through service to each other and to the greater community we live in. Completed pledge cards should be returned by mail or in person if we're worshiping at church by Stewardship Sunday, October the 25th. There's also an online pledge card available on the church website under the Give menu item. Thank you on behalf of the Stewardship Committee. Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, I know we say this often, but we mean it. We are truly living in extraordinary times, and we need your strength and wisdom more and more every day. Help us to remember that you have a plan and that you are always here for us. We pray that you guide the hearts and hands of medical professionals, healthcare workers, and first responders everywhere. We pray for the scientists working around the clock to develop and test vaccines and treatments to fight COVID-19. We pray for essential workers everywhere, that they say, stay safe and healthy, help all the truck drivers, distribution center workers, grocery clerks, and daycare providers, comfort them and give them courage. As children, teachers, and administrators return to school, help them approach each day with patience, empathy, and minds open to new ways of teaching and learning. The pandemic has been difficult for everyone, but particularly so for the parents of young children. Give them energy, endurance, and consolation as they try to do their own work from home and support their children's distance learning. We ask you to watch over the firefighters battling the wildfires in California, Oregon, and throughout the West. Build up the relief workers helping those in the path of hurricanes and flooding. Lord, the strain of our new existence weighs heavily upon us, but we remain hopeful and grateful. Grateful for the coolness of the evening as we slide gently into fall. Grateful for friends, neighbors, and family who, despite the obstacles, stay connected and supportive by whatever means they are able. We're grateful for Pastor Mary and Pastor Bill, who have inspired and challenged us in so many creative ways through these many months of worship from afar. We're grateful for all the Overbrook staff and volunteers. We're also grateful for the many opportunities we have these days to serve you as we serve others. All of this we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We're happy that you could join us. Now go. Go from this place back to the journeys from which you turned aside to be here seeking to love and serve the Lord with all that you have and all that you are. And as you go, may the grace of God the Father and the peace of Jesus Christ, God's Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all, now and forever. Amen. Amen.